The British Empire was worldwide in 1914, and the sun truly never set upon it. It had been built by centuries of war and conquest abroad, but this week, something different happened. For the first time in over 200 years, British civilians at home were killed by enemy action. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, we saw the Austro-Hungarian army disgraced as it retreated once again from Serbia, having been badly beaten by the Serbs. Further north, the Austrians were pushing the Russians back in the mountains, while even further north, the German-Russian front had settled into stalemate for the winter. The Western Front was also still in stalemate, where it would remain for years, and the German Pacific Navy had been finally destroyed. 1915 is just around the corner, so let's take a look at how some of the warring nations now viewed the war. Britain and France were by this point committed to the destruction of Prussian militarism, and they meant to ensure that post-war Germany would not have the industrial or military means to start another war. Thing is, this made the conditions for victory nothing short of total victory in order to be able to dictate such terms. The Germans were a little more existential about the whole thing. They realized that defeat would mean total disgrace. Now, they certainly had no initial plans for world domination, but as things unfolded, the schemes got grander and grander, especially among bankers and industrialists, who enthusiastically spoke of annexations and not just economic hegemony as the result. Army Chief of Staff Falkenhayn, for example, had ideas of permanent conquest in the West, though not in the East. The German strategy had been based on a quick war, so 1915 was the war year that never should have been. Germany found itself on a huge two-front war against Russia and France, with England slowly pulling her strength together from her worldwide empire that would eventually see her also fielding millions of soldiers on the Western Front. At around this time in Germany, there were the suddenly popular catchwords, the war must be won in the East. And many people believed that it was actually possible to defeat Russia by force of arms, and this would cause the Western allies to change their minds about the war and sue for peace. This was ludicrous. No decision in the East would spare them from fighting to the end in the West. And the French and British really had no option other than to continue to attack and attack and attack on the Western Front. Germany's successes back in August had given her most of Belgium and a huge chunk of industrial France, and the Germans were only around 100 kilometers from Paris. French General Joseph Joffre couldn't take a passive approach, which would allow the Germans to either plan a big offensive or transfer troops to the Eastern Front, especially with the patriotic issue of getting the Germans off of French soil. The big question was, how? The answer for the moment was a series of winter offensives that began this week and continued well into 1915. One of these was the First Battle of Artois, which began on December 17th. The objective was gaining control of the heights of the Vimy Ridge. Interestingly, the French began to use siege techniques from centuries ago that now, once again, had a place in warfare. They sapped trenches across no man's land and connected them to form jumping off points as close to the German lines as possible. They also began to avoid mass offensives and instead made series of smaller attacks against points of tactical importance, such as the ridge. In addition to the developing action at Artois, the Champagne Offensive was just about to begin all along a 40-kilometer stretch from Auberive to Massige in an attempt to break through to the Mezières railway junction. Over 250,000 troops would be deployed, backed by 700 guns. That is a huge number of men, but as we've seen time and again, it's often dwarfed by the amount of men fighting on the Eastern Front. Now, a couple of weeks ago, there we saw the Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army pushing the Russians back at the Battle of Limanova to halt the Russian drive towards Budapest. That battle finally ended this week with a Russian defeat. The Austrians held the Duke La Pass, and the threat of Russian invasion of Hungary was over. Actually, the Austrians nearly had an opportunity to surround the Russians, but the winter weather and the inadequate railway system ruined that chance. This was not quite the end of the War of Motion on the Eastern Front, which had emphatically ended on the Western one, but it was another big step in ending the possibilities of Russian invasions of Austrian or German territory. British territory was not, on the other hand, safe anymore. On December 16th, the German Navy bombarded Scarborough, Whitley, and Hartlepool, which resulted in the first British civilians killed by enemy action since 1690. 
You gotta wonder what the Germans were thinking, though. This was a purely terrorist exercise that didn't have a military purpose. On the contrary, it was to demoralize the British by highlighting their vulnerability. But it failed. In fact, it had just the opposite effect and was a huge propaganda victory for the British, certainly increasing popular hatred of the Germans and stealing British resolve. And in future, the Germans would even be sometimes known as the baby killers of Scarborough. Thing is, German Admiral Franz von Hipper was totally unenthusiastic about bombing British seaside towns, which he thought completely irrelevant strategically. He was really concerned with facing the British fleet, and he actually should have had his chance this very day. For all the remembrance of Scarborough, the events of December 16, 1914 could have gone many, many times worse for the British. See, British codebreakers knew already the 14th that von Hipper was heading out the following day for a raid, but didn't know his target. So there were six British battleships and four battle cruisers waiting at Dogger Bank in the North Sea, with some support, to engage von Hipper when they could find him. But what the codebreakers did not know was that the entire German high seas fleet was heading right for the British ships, including 18 dreadnoughts and 54 destroyers. Now, during the night and morning of the 16th, a few rival destroyers engaged each other occasionally, but the seas were too heavy for anything decisive, and visibility was pretty terrible. But after a few hours, the question became evident. Where was the high seas fleet? Well, Admiral Friedrich von Ingenohl had suddenly taken it home. Seriously, at 5.45 in the morning, after hearing about the clashing destroyers, he had erroneously assumed that he was about to face the entire Grand Fleet. But his mission was only to support von Hipper's coastal raid, and he had no orders from the Kaiser to fight a big battle. So he turned around and went home and threw away the German Navy's best strategic opportunity of the entire war. Both fleets made it back home without the loss of a ship, but while the Germans lost a great battle opportunity and the British got a PR boost, think how much respect the British fleet lost when its actions of that day became public. It knew that von Hipper was coming, but did not try to head him off from the coast, sacrificing dozens of civilian lives with hundreds more injured, and then failed to intercept him after the attack when he was heading home, meaning those people, those British civilians, were sacrificed for nothing. Not a good day for the British Navy. Neither was it a good day for someone we haven't heard from yet in the war. Neutral Portugal, specifically Portuguese Angola. This week saw the Battle of Naulila, which actually has a bit of a backstory. In October, a German delegation to the fort of Naulila from German Southwest Africa to negotiate a non-aggression pact had been killed, and the Germans had responded by attacking and destroying first Fort Kuangar and then some other small forts. Now, on December 18th, it was Naulila's turn. The attack was quick, and the Portuguese fled after a few hours of fighting, during which they lost about 150 men, roughly five times the German losses. But Portugal and Germany were still not officially at war, and indeed would not be until 1916, in spite of skirmishes between their colonial territories. Funny how many people can die in a war when you're not at war. So that's where we stand at the end of the week, with small actions in Africa, small actions along the British coast that triggered a big outrage, a huge action beginning in France, and a huge action ending in the East. Think how it must have felt to the people of Scarborough, Whitley, and Hartlepool. Oh sure, they were at war and knew it, but no one, not even Napoleon, had attacked the ordinary people of their little island kingdom for hundreds of years. It meant a quick and rude awakening to the reality of modern war. That this was not a war of honor, not a war of decency, and not a war conducted by any traditional moral standards. It was a war of brutality and of death on a scale never before imagined. And it was a war where no one, man, woman, or child, in any of the warring nations was safe. If you missed last week's episode where we talked about the Austro-Hungarian Empire being badly beaten by the Serbs, and click right here. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter if you want more Inside Dope on the Great War. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Tell all your friends about us. See you next week.